Hey everybody, Dr. Vaccaro here, and we're going to go through a film scoring library queue in the, the style of sort of a big metal-esque epic film score. So my goal in putting this together was really to give uh, an overview of how I put together these kind of modern high gain guitar sounds that are really emblematic of, of a lot of modern film scores. And again, this isn't necessarily how we would go for getting every electric guitar sound. This is a, a very particular case in point to try and get a, uh, a style that fits in with this modern film scoring sound. So to start off with, we're going to take a listen through this cue and we'll just listen to it from start to finish and then we'll go back and break it down and go through the process through which I created the cue um, both in terms of my composition process as well as the the technical details for getting all these sounds and putting this together so here we go There it is, short cue. Uh, three main parts. We have a short intro at the beginning. We have a first section and then a second section. So let's uh, take a moment and we're going to go back and break this down and follow the composition process. So we're going to start out by listening to the first thing that I wrote for this, which is the guitar one part. And to begin with, I'm going to take off most of my signal processing on this. So this guitar was DI'd. It was recorded with a direct insert I plugged in through an API 512C uh, mic preamp. And that is running into my analog to digital converter. So this is just the raw guitar sound to the output of the guitar. Um, now, ordinarily for this kind of project, I would actually mic amps. I'm fortunate enough that I do have a, a decent amp collection. However, I think for the purposes of this demo, it's probably more interesting to see how we might do this with plugins. And it turns out it's, it's pretty much the same basic process. It's really a question of whether I'm doing these amps with actual live high gain and low gain amplifiers or whether I'm doing this with plugins. So in any case, here we go. Here's the uh, original guitar part. We've got a, a pretty straightforward guitar part. Um, these are what guitarists call power chords. So they're basically open fifths and they are happening on the lowest string of the instrument. I'm playing the low E and the B an octave above, or the B a fifth above. In fact, I have a MIDI part here to show you the voicing for what we're looking at here. So for the guitar part, we are looking at these notes. So this is the guitar part that we just heard transcribed in MIDI. And the reason I've done this is in part, I want to draw some attention to musically how we arrange for the guitar to get these kind of big modern sounding guitar parts. And we usually start with power chords. Now, 
all of us have been through music theory class and we've studied our common practice period functional harmony and along the way we were taught certain voice leading practices that are essential for that style of music but i want to draw attention to the fact that in this case we're doing something very different than we do in traditional multi-voice counterpoint so the prohibition against objectionable parallelism the the idea that we avoid parallel fifths and parallel octaves ultimately comes down to counterpoint practice and the desire to maintain independence of voice. If I start out writing two voice counterpoint, and at some point those two voices move in parallel fifths or in parallel octaves, we've lost the independence of voice. We've gone from two voices to one voice. My texture collapsed because of bad voice leading. The goal is to maintain the independence of voice. In this context, though, I want to make clear we're really doing something very different. This is not two independent voices traveling in parallel fifths. This is the opposite situation. This is a single musical voice that's simply being orchestrated and filled out with that fifth above. And I tend to think of this based on the harmonic series. So in this case, I have this guitar part. Um, So those are the two notes in the guitar part. Um, you'll note they look like they're an octave lower than we tend to think of guitar. That is because octave sounds, uh, the guitar sounds an octave lower than written. And then we have our bass guitar playing the low E. And again, that's the bass guitar down there. So we end up with a really nice sort of sonorous, open harmonic series voicing. And Again, it really is just a single voice in this play, in this case, playing the E, G, C, and then A. So why am I thinking about the harmonic series when I'm talking about guitar parts? Well, the reason for that is because we're going to go through a significant amount of harmonic distortion for these high gain guitar parts. And harmonic distortion adds harmonics. And in most cases, we find we tend to pretty prevalently add odd harmonics when we start going through a lot of distortion. So here we have the rest of the harmonic series now up to the fifth harmonic. So now we have our E, our E an octave above, B a f octave and a fifth, the twelfth above the low note, E two octaves above, and then the G sharp, um, two octaves and a third above. So this is our first harmonic. This is our third harmonic. This is our fifth harmonic. So that major third, or at least the version of it that occurs in the harmonic series, is actually going to be a fairly essential part of how we think about um, the, the high gain amplifiers starting to sound. So just to play what that sounds like, um, voiced out as, again, one sort of uber musical voice, a single musical voice. Playing those notes. All right, so as I'm look as I'm thinking about this guitar voicing again, I'm not thinking of this as independent parts or uh, independent voices. This is really going to be one uber part, and in fact, all of the guitar parts we're about to go through and start breaking down, I'm very much thinking of them as sort of assembling into one musical voice. For me, the the challenge that I find is as a guitar player when I'm playing an amp that's doing a really high gain tone in the room, it's typically a very loud amp. There's a visceral, uh, meaningful physical quality to the the high gain. Uh, high dB level of that amplifier. And to try and get that conveyed in a recording can often be tricky. What we find is that when we mic that amp and just try and record that tone, it's often a little underwhelming in a recording. It sounds a little bit demo-ish. It sounds a little bit low-tech, lo-fi. So we're going to start going through the process through which we take that kind of basic tone and start to build it into something a little more interesting. So I'm going to take out a couple of elements here so we can get back to the uh, dry guitar tone. And I'm going to play that original guitar part again.
And I'm going to run this through an amp simulator. In this case, uh, for this particular guitar, I'm using IK Multimedia's Amplitube. And I believe this is their attempt at a Mesa Boogie triple rectifier. So this is from their general Amplitube brand um, plugin. So these aren't licensed to have um, name brands associated with them. These are the simulations. But um, this to me is a very Mesa Boogie-ish type amp. And so the way I have this set up, um, we have, uh, for those of you who are not guitarists, the way we uh, tend to run guitar amplifiers when we're getting distortion, we have a preamp, which is the portion that takes us from instrument level up to line level. We have some signal processing, in this case, uh, a simple EQ. There's a spring reverb, but I have it turned all the way off. And then there's the power amp. In a real amplifier, this is the actual high-powered amplifier that's going to drive the actual speakers. And then we would have a guitar cabinet, speakers, that are the actual source of sound that we would mic up. So this plugin gives us the ability to simulate that stuff. And again, in this case, I'm running the preamp very, very high gain. So I'm going to get a lot of distortion and a particular flavor of guitar distortion from this preamp being cranked up all the way. And then the power amp is actually set relatively low to get a fairly clean sound from that. Um, in other words, what we're hearing is almost entirely preamp distortion, no power amp distortion. That'll be a little different on some other amps that we'll look at along the way here, but here we go. Here is that amp. I'm going to bring it back pan to center again, but here is the Mesa Boogie-esque amp on that guitar part. <laughs> couple little tuning discrepancies in there, and we'll talk a little bit about why that's there. Um, in fact, it'll become kind of obvious in a moment when we uh, start listening to the next couple of guitar tracks. But again, if, we, if that was the only guitar part we had, and we had a, a pretty basic drum sound, It's a little underwhelming. By that that modern big film score sound, we really haven't achieved that. So let's look at how we're gonna thicken this up a little bit. So the next thing that I did, and it's labeled Guitar 4, it was actually the second one that I tracked. I made what's called a double track. So I basically just went through and played the same guitar part and pretty much just did the same thing again. And I'm going to switch this over for a moment, um, and I'll explain the difference here. So this is the doubled guitar track. So the two of those together, when I hard pan them left and right, really start to give us a nice filled out sound stage. So they fill out our soundstage really nicely, but because they are two separate performances and they're not perfectly aligned in terms of time, and there's some subtle tuning discrepancies between those two parts, they start to fill out the soundstage, but they maintain the sound of sort of two separate guitars at the edge of the soundstage. Leaves a little bit of a gap in the middle, and that's going to work to our advantage when we start filling in the guitar parts in the middle. So the second guitar part... I set up an amp for that, also in Amplitube, and this one is based on a Marshall, a 50-watt Marshall, 
and it's in a relatively high preamp gain mode, but the volume is turned up a little bit. The power amps are cranked a little bit more. And so this is going to be a, a subtly different tone, but um, it is still definitely going to be a moderately high gain tone, but it's going to be a little different than the first one. So you notice there's some sonic differences between those, and that is by design. So when I pan these back out again and play these two tracks together, we start to get a nice, full complementary tone that fills out the sound stage a little bit. It feels a little bit bigger physically on the sound stage. And when I start to add my drums back in with that, So when I add the drums in with that, it starts to feel a little bit bigger. It's starting to get a little closer to the, the, the place we want to go. Now, I want to go back to that idea of building off of the overtone series and trying to build a sort of more complex, thicker chord voicing. And in a lot of cases, the way that I would do that as a player is to play just a six string chord through my tube amp. And, you know, I can get a really great sound that way. But again, to try and translate that to a recording, we often find it's better to break things up a little bit. So these outside two guitar tracks are really only using the bottom two strings, um, bottom two or three strings of the, of the electric guitar. The next part that I added goes up an octave and goes to a slightly different voicing. Um, so instead of just doing straight parallel fifths, it now plays a little bit of a contrary motion line, mainly just to stay in that same register. So um, I believe you should be able to hear this on the microphone, but... I think I went to that for that voicing on this track. So in this one, so in the lowest two voices, I used the, the lowest two strings. And in this one, I'm gonna really try and use the middle strings of the guitar. And here's what this guitar part sounds like by itself. So for this one, I went with a different uh, plugin. This one is a plugin from the Plugin Alliance. This is a simulation of a diesel amplifier. Diesel is a, a fairly high gain boutique amp. And this one with that high gain tone. <laughs> So again, in and of itself, that guitar tone isn't necessarily where we want to end up, but adding it to our mix, we originally had these two guitar parts playing the doubled part. And let's add in this part to the mix. And I have that guitar soft panned off to the left. 
So finally, the third element, the last guitar part that we're going to add to this, uh, you can probably guess since we had two parts on the lowest two strings, one part on the middle string, we're going to have one part that comes in using just the highest strings. And initially when I tracked this, I thought I might go a particular direction with this just based on past experience. So I initially thought that I might go with a lower gain amplifier and I was using a, a another amplitude simulation, this one of a Vox AC30. And I had a little bit busier guitar part that was going to play a, a bit of a counter pattern. And a couple of things that I wanted to have in there. I wanted to have a drone string. So throughout this guitar part, the open E string, the high E string, is playing the entire time. And then I got a little bit of contrary motion going and played around and came up with a line that I thought was cool. And what I came up with for that guitar part was this. <laughs> And with the other guitar parts, that gives us this sort of complex uber voice. And I'm going to take this EQ off because that's not actually uh, ap applicable for this amp. <laughs> So I liked that idea, but for this particular cue, it wasn't quite the direction that I wanted to go. It was a little busier than I wanted. Um, but again, I just wanted to show this busier guitar part that I often might put in over this kind of heavy part and the, the lower gain amplifier. Um, now again, this is still an amplifier that's definitely distorted. <laughs> but it's a world apart from or this. So again, we get a very different impact. And by putting all of those tones together, we start to build a composite tone that's got a lot of rich and interesting character. <laughs> So after trying that guitar part, I decided to go with something a little simpler and I ended up just playing the chords on the beat and I simplified that line a little bit and so we ended up with this part. <laughs> Now, if I were working on this for a real cue for any kind of decent length film, there's a pretty good chance I would save that other part and I would bring it back in as a variation on this part, have it feel like it developed from this simpler part. But for the cue that I was working on for this, I just wanted to stay as simple as possible and so I went back to that simpler pattern. And putting that in context with the other guitar parts. <laughs> started to get a little closer to where I wanted to be. Now, one of the things that I notice with that, and this is pretty common, the lower gain amplifier is a lot less compressed. And we hear that in this case in the lack of sustain to the part. Those spectral components coming from that particular guitar amp decay a lot more quickly in this composite sound than the other sounds. Check, a check that out for a moment. <laughs> So in that scenario, one of the ways that I usually deal with that is, of course, to add some compression to the guitar. 
which allows me to get a little more sustain out of that guitar part. <laughs> And I like that. That's a sound that I go for quite often. And again, what we ended up with were a couple of different high gain amplifiers, a sort of mid gain amplifier, and then a lower gain amplifier. All of them in distortion, all of them in distortion mode, but building a sort of complementary set of sounds. A few other things that I have in play here. Um, first off, I have some high pass filters, and in this case, they're actually set quite low and they're set before my amp plugin. The main reason for that is that I'm playing this guitar part on a fully hollow body jazz guitar and there is a tendency sometimes to end up bumping on the guitar and because it's a big full hollow body you do get some low frequency information that will sometimes go through and end up going through the amplifier it eats up headroom it changes the sound of the distortion and it's not really useful audio information it's not anything that i'm intentionally trying to get into the recording so i did just add like i say a little bit of a high pass it's actually quite low well below the range of the guitar it's really just there to take out any super low frequency thumps before they go through the amplifier. And I did that on all of the amplifiers. Now, that really high guitar part, I actually have a high pass filter in set quite high after the amplifier. <laughs> Now, there's a lot of low-end information that I'm taking out, a lot of low and mid information that really is actually kind of nice in that sound. So we are losing quite a bit of low and low mid information. And if I were working maybe in a more classic rock setting, somewhere like that, where that guitar part was gonna be a little more exposed and wasn't supported and sweetened by other guitar tracks, I really wouldn't think about getting rid of quite that much low and mid information off of that guitar track. But in this case, because I know I've got so much spectral content in these other tracks, adding yet one more element in that range really isn't gonna buy me that much. And it's not what this guitar part is doing in the overall composite tone. So again, um, in that case, it's really functioning um, a little differently than these other high passes that are in place here. So by this point, I have my four guitar parts layered. <laughs> I can get a little more sustain, again, out of that Vox type tone here. And just to be clear, this amp, the way it's set up, doesn't have a separate preamp control. So the distortion that we're getting from this Vox amp comes from turning the power amp all the way up. In other words, we're getting a very different character to the distortion, mainly power tube distortion, um, as opposed to some of the other amps where we were getting primarily preamp tube distortion. And again, with a little bit of compression. That sound starts to come together. However, I decided that wasn't really the direction that I wanted to go for with this cue. So I ended up swapping out and going for a different amp. I ended up using the Plugin Alliance Ingle, um, I believe this is an E646VS simulation, a much more high gain amp. And it's unusual that when I do this approach that I would end up with four high gain amplifiers, but it worked well for this cue. Um, but to be honest, probably more often than not, I would end up with a Vox tone somewhere in this set of tracks. <laughs> So with that, my guitar tone came together to a place I was pretty happy with. <laughs> we 
with that part well underway, I was able to shift, and so for the next part of the video here, I'm going to run briefly through the, the composition process for the rest of this cue, and then we'll come back and dig in a little more deeply on some other guitar-related ideas towards the end here. So the next section that I worked on, I had those punctuation hits at the end of that section we've been listening to. And I knew I wanted a big percussion moment. I, I wanted that to be sort of in the vein of modern action adventure. So I wanted to go for something that was going to be a lot of taiko drums, a lot of frame drums, uh, a sort of big modern percussive battery. Um, I tend to associate this with like Bear McCreary on Battlestar Galactica, where he made great use of this technique. So for this one, I'm using a East-West library from Storm Drum 2 called Earthquake Ensemble. So just a variety of different kind of uh, percussive instruments, and I ended up going with a, a bit of a sextuplet groove for that. kind of feel. And I really liked the direction that that was going. That was not what I was thinking when I wrote this original section. I was simply thinking in a simple quadruple meter, thinking straight 16th notes. And once that 16th note groove had made its way into my composition process down here, I started thinking a little about trying to get my drum part to maybe bridge the gap. Um, between those two fields. So I ended up going back and almost immediately went back and started working on my drum part. And I'm going to play the rest of what this developed into. Again, it started out as a really simple 4-4 four, four kind of groove, but by the time we get to the tom fill here at the end of the first repetition of the, the chord progression, um, we go into a second feel and it starts to take on a bit of a purdy shuffle feel, a bit of a halftime shuffle groove. So those two drum parts started to flow together a lot better for me. Now, by the time I had done this, I knew, um, I kind of knew from the outset that I was likely going to end up re-recording these guitar parts. And the reason for that is because performance-wise, remember, I started out tracking this guitar part. I did it to a click track. There was no other music there. So I wasn't reacting to anything. I wasn't performing as a performer as part of a musical texture and a shared vision for where this piece was going to be. I didn't actually know it yet. I hadn't written the piece yet. So... I knew once I started getting that shuffle feel in, I was going to have to go back and retrack all the guitars and the bass part. And I want to mention that because it is such an essential part of trying to get a really, really good sounding cue. If you don't go back and perform all those parts once you've written them, thinking about it the way we would if we were working with real performers, I would work on this cue, I would write it, I would prepare it, I would work with a director and get final approval before I would go to record and finish the final recording process. So I would really know that cue quite well. If it's an orchestral cue, I often need to be prepared to conduct it. So there's a lot that goes into this. And when we bring that higher level of musicianship that comes from having rehearsed this a few times and then going back and performing as part of a shared musical vision with other performers, in this case, they're still all me, but multiple versions of myself, we do get a solid and more, uh, more solid and better final result from it. So at that point, I started adding some orchestral elements to that big drum section at the end. And the first thing that I decided I wanted to do was to double that the guitar punctuation with strings. That was the first way for me to start getting out of the big rock feel that we've got going in those eight measures there and start to get a bit of an orchestral film score kind of feel. <laughs> Now, 
Now I'm using the same kind of pyramid chord, same kind of stacked um, harmonic series kind of chord in that. And because I don't have any independent parts going at all in the strings, that is a single 80 person string section, just a single sample set. And to that, I ended up adding some brass. Um, I believe this is a patch of four horns. And by that point, this thing really had started to take some shape. So with the ending starting to come along, I decided I was going to put some attention into the intro. This is something that I had brought up in class the other day, that over the years I've amassed a, a collection of old sort of junk instruments that I bought at places like yard sales, various things like that. And I intentionally keep these not necessarily to restore them and make them sound like they were originally intended, but to use them as just sort of random and interesting sound sources in film scores. It's a way to put a unique touch, a unique thumbprint on all of the things that you work, and it's a, uh, it's a way to get out of the sound world of the same common sound libraries that so many of us are using over and over again for scoring work. So for the purposes of this recording, I actually took that small harp that I had shown you guys in class the other day. So this is a small desktop harp. It's in a pretty bad state of disrepair, um, but there's a lot of strings on it, and I decided I was going to play it with the drumsticks and just tap out a little sextuplet pattern, and this is what I came up with. Now, the two strings that I found that I was playing on were almost at an E, not quite. So I did a little bit of pitch shifting to pull them up closer. Now we've got some microtonal variations there kind of by design. I knew those two strings weren't gonna be in tune, but um, what I was looking for again was some sort of sound source material that I could use and to get something that started with a very organic sound and then to give it a bit of a digital twist. So I took that same sound and I sent it through the Eventide Black Hole plugin in the Nebula setting. So this is sort of an unusual reverb plugin for um, very extreme reverb effects. And here's what we get. So that was starting to become the kind of cool textural element I wanted for my intro as it sort of snuck in. And after listening to it once or twice, I decided the next element I was going to add was going to be another kind of quasi percussive element. And I started looking around for things and I found on the guitar that I was playing, which again was a fully hollow body jazz guitar. It has a trapeze style tailpiece. So between the bridge and the tailpiece, the, the portion of the string on the other side of the bridge from where we normally play. Um, there were a couple of good notes that worked well for me, and so I decided I was going to pluck those and came up with sort of a counter rhythm to go against that first part. And when I did that, I discovered that first off, the pickups weren't picking up that sound very well. It's on the wrong side of the bridge. The string just doesn't vibrate much on the other side. So I ended up having to put a mic on that part, and what I came up with was this. Now, I wanted to give that another sort of electronic element as well. So I grabbed another Eventide plugin, in this case, the H3000 band delays. So these are um, band notch filters with different delay times. And in this case, there's also some different panning for each of those elements. So this gives this part a little bit of movement and makes it sound again a little bit electronic-y. Just hearing that by itself. Okay. 
gave me a nice bit of motion there. Now, when I sat down to record that guitar part and I was sliding in to the, the position around the microphone, my, my chair actually squeaked in a cool rhythmic pattern. And so that actually happened out here during the count, the count in. So I just grabbed that little section and ended up dropping it in in place as a loop. And that got my intro to this point where I wanted it to be. So I decided I was going to take a few of these elements and bring them back in at the end. So as you see, I actually did chase, uh, tray. I actually did track uh, the plucking guitar part all the way through. So it just added another textural element and especially helped to fill a little bit of the space in between those punctuating marks from the guitar. Now, the plucked string part really kind of disappears. It gets eaten up by the guitar part, the bass, everything else that's happening here. Everywhere except the very last repetition. pretty much disappears all through that, all the way up to the end. And that was a nice moment, kind of gave me a, a sense of things dropping out, a bit of conclusion there. So I knew that was gonna be my ending. So let me throw the uh, drums and stuff back in and hear how that came together. <laughs> That gave me uh, something I wanted to do for the ending. So at this point, the cue had really come along and started to develop some nice builds, some nice sort of cinematic moments. And there were a couple of other elements that I was thinking about adding. And at this point, a happy accident happened. I was dragging this drum loop that I have for the storm drum and just slipped off the, the mouse and ended up dropping it into the piano track and played it, and the rhythm sounded really cool. Now, it was the wrong notes, because obviously it was the notes that I chose to get drum sounds in that part. So I went back and took that same rhythm and twisted them into the prevailing E sonority that we were working with and ended up with this part. <laughs> which started to give me one more element to throw in as this piece was building up through here. So by this point, uh, I think we had, we didn't have voices in yet. That was one of the next elements and I hadn't added the metal element yet. So I believe this should pretty much be where I was at that point. <laughs> So I thought that was pretty cool. That worked really well. That piano part hadn't, uh, I, to be honest, I'd thrown it in here mainly to demo those voicings for all of you down here. And I had originally done that back here where the guitar parts actually were. And it was just a way for me to go through and show you how I was thinking about trying to space the notes that I was going to layer into this guitar part from the harmonic series. Um, but now I ended up using that piano part here. And the next time I played through it, I had forgotten that I had this part there and really liked how the piano sounded with the guitars. So I went back and tweaked that part a little bit and ended up with a piano part. Well, we'll just play it with the drums. <laughs> So 
So put a little bit of feel in it, got a little bit of that shuffle feel in the second time through, and that really started to fill out that that opening um, section for me. And there's a really nice moment on the the chord voicing where the uh, the piano part really kind of shifts that fourth chord, the uh, the C chord, in a, a really nice way. <laughs> So at this point, uh, as I listened through it, one of the things that I found myself wishing for was some shouted voice parts going through the, uh, the, the big section here. And so I played around with a couple of different libraries, and in the East-West library, I found that I had in the choirs a couple of effects patches for shouts, and so I grabbed the alto and the bass shouting, They're just shouting vowel sounds, and so I didn't want to get too fancy. I didn't have text or anything that I was setting, so I actually just set them up to make those vowel sounds for both the basses and the altos, and ended up with this. Of course, it sounds a little ridiculous by itself, as uh, as most film score vocal parts should, if we're doing that uh, Morricone sort of thing. But in context, it actually added a really nice human element, a sort of big epic quality to this section here. <laughs> Last thing I added to this was just I needed something that built a little bit more in the percussion, and I had a lot of drums going. I didn't have a lot of metallic stuff going. So I found another sample set that had some nice metal stuff and came up with this part. And that gave me sort of the build that I was looking for, and that was really the last musical part that I added to any of this. So that kind of takes us through the composition process. At this point, I want to shift and we'll um, wrap up talking about how we pulled, how I pulled the rest of the mix elements together to get to the final version of the mix. So at this point, we're going to dig in a little bit on the mix side. And so far, we've been listening to the drum kit pretty much as I had been listening to it. Unprocessed, just the, the raw samples that uh, I had used from Stephen Slate Drums. And let me show you real quickly how I have this set up. Um, this is actually how I'm running most of my virtual instruments, but for those of you who aren't familiar with this feature, it really becomes an essential way of utilizing something like Stephen Slate drums to get a really good mix. So in the, the drum kit, I of course have my, um, have my drum kit. Just one that I picked that I thought worked well for the sound that I was going for. And within the mixer, there's a feature that a lot of times I think goes overlooked, which is that down at the bottom you have output routing. And from this plugin, you have 16 stereo output buses and another chunk of mono output buses. And so the way I have this set up is that my kick drums are all coming on output two. My snare drum, all of the various snare drum elements are coming on output three. The toms are coming on output six. Hi-hat's coming on output four, ride cymbal is coming on output five. 
as are, I'm not using clap or cowbell on this or tambourine. Um, the overheads are coming on output one and I only used one of the room sounds and I pulled it down quite a bit. It's uh, down about 11 dB from the, uh, the, main, uh, the main dry sound. And those are both coming on output one. Then within Pro Tools on my instrument tracks, again, these are instrument tracks. So in the track lane, you have MIDI data, but you do have a full audio signal path here on the mix side. So on the instrument portion of my channel strip, I'm sending to the same MIDI channel on Steven Slate drums. Um, that's because the Steven Slate drums, obviously everything is all on one MIDI channel and the, the different sounds come from the different MIDI notes. But on my audio inputs, this is where I've selected from the plugin inputs from Steven Slate Drum Sampler to get all of my inputs. So I have a dedicated kick track. So this gives me the ability to do a mix as if I had actually set up multiple microphones on a drum kit and I had the ability and wanted to go back and process each one individually to get the sounds where I wanted. And for me, this is really essential because I often find I do want to go back and mix this stuff a little bit. And so one of the first places I knew that the, the drum kits weren't really cutting it. I liked the snare drum sound. It's a nice snare drum. I picked it for a reason. However, it didn't have that epic quality that I was looking for, that bigger than life 90s modern rock sound that uh, that to me was so essential for, for this cue. So I did a trick that actually goes back to the 1980s, though in this application we're doing it to a little lesser effect. And so the first thing I did is I set up an aux send coming off of my dry snare drum track and sent that in to an aux in in Pro Tools. And so I'm doing my processing in parallel. So I still have my dry, regular snare drum tone, but I also have my aux send running in parallel. In this case, I've set it right next to the snare drum track rather than having it off to the right with my master faders. This is just a workflow issue. Obviously, some people, um, particularly a lot of us who grew up working with consoles, tend to expect auxes to be down close to the master fader. I find a lot of times, for especially for demo videos, it's nice to be able to see them side by side. And I have to admit, the longer I've worked in the box over the years, the more inclined I have become to work this way, just to have my faders on related ideas all very close together. So in any case, first thing in our signal path is a pitch shifter. And in this case, I'm using the Eventide Harmonizer simulation. Um, basically, it's a 20 cent micro pitch shift. I'm a little sharp on one side, I'm a little flat on the other, about 10 cents on each side. And what that gives me is a little more tamburally rich tone because the pitch areas in that snare drum are now going to have some additional frequency content that sort of stretch out and expand those pitch areas. So let's take a listen to without it and with it. So it takes that same snare drum and obviously uh, gives us a little more pitch, a little more interesting timbral content. But the other thing that I'm gonna do is I'm also gonna go through and I'm gonna add just a small amount of delay to those. So that starts to widen out that snare drum a little bit. Um, I'm getting a spread stereo image because I now have some inter-channel time differences between the left and the right channel. Whereas with just the mono snare drum, it was right in the middle, no time differences. So it begins to occupy a little more lateral space on my sound stage. That was one of the key things that I was looking for. And it gave me a bit more timbrely rich tone, a bit more timbral complexity. Now, the other element that I wanted to add to this was a gated reverb. So I'm going to show you how I tend to set these up. Again, this may be a bit remedial for people on the audio side, but if you're a composer trying to learn this stuff, you may have never actually known how to do this. So the way I have this set up, I have a plugin for a reverb. 
and I'm using a lexicon plate simulation. The reason I chose a plate reverb was just because my experience with plate reverbs is that they tend to add some mid and low mid oomph, and that's kind of the effect that I'm looking for. So let's hear that with the plate reverb added. So that's adding quite a bit to that sound. Now, the, the great thing, I like what it's doing spectrally, but I'm not necessarily into the duration of and the envelope of that reverb. So this is where the gated reverb sound comes in. So I have a noise gate set up downstream from my reverb, and I'm going to use it to close the, the gate on the reverb. Uh, the couple of key things, though, the way I have this implemented, I'm using this as a side-chained compressor, or a side-chained gate, rather. So the input on this is actually the dry snare drum, and that allows me to get the threshold, attack, and release time set really precisely so that I can use this to shape the envelope of that reverb into something a bit more unnatural so that it doesn't sound like a reverb. It starts to sound like something that's tamperally fused and just part of this interesting-sounding snare drum. And using the hold and release time, that's how I'm going to shape that sound and get that to uh, get that to work how I want. So again, if this this is a, an effect that goes back to the '80s, for like an '80s snare drum tone, um, if I was doing something very uh, Stranger Things, super '80s throwback, I would go way in on that gated reverb sound. something that's really going to radically alter that snare drum tone from where we started. But I'm going for more of a 90s sound. And in the 90s, we tended to do this same kind of effect. We just did it with a little more subtlety to keep it a bit more of an organic snare drum sound that was just a little bigger than life. So I pulled this down by maybe 10 dB or so. Now, let's put that in context with the rest of the drums and see where that got us. Here's without it. Here's with it. Without. With. So definitely the, the kind of impact that I wanted, it got that drum shaped out to be the way that I wanted it. So this is a, a pretty typical application for how we might use a gated reverb on snare drum. So once I've got that gated reverb pretty well locked in on my drum part, the next thing that I wanted to start working on was some compression for the drum mix overall. Now, the way I have my signal routed, I have all of my drum source tracks. They are routed out on bus 1-2, which is coming in on this submix track here. This is just an aux in track. And on this aux in track, I do have a little bit of group uh, compression happening in the form of the McDSP AC202. This is a tape simulator. And this is in a mode right now to simulate an Otari style tape deck in terms of how the head bump is behaving. And you can see I have this in a vintage mode. Typically when I use these tape simulators, I do often find I like the effect of the um, older style formulation uh, because typically what I'm using this for is a specific timbral effect. So I want to hear a little bit of that tape compression. And in this case, um, that's what I'm putting the drums through. Now, the Steven Slate drums, again, the, the samples actually do have a fair amount of compression. They're great samples coming out of the box. But I do want to start to sort of marry the whole kit together in a way that I find a little more compelling. And so I set up a parallel compressor. And for, again, for those of you who are not mix-minded, who are not familiar with this process, the idea of a parallel compressor is that instead of compressing in the signal path on the channel strip, I'm going to set up a compressor on an aux send and return. And I'm not going to compress 
the the actual signal coming through to the uh, to the drum sub mix bus. I'm going to add in parallel an aggressively compressed version of it. So we often call this upward compression. The idea is that a normal compressor is a downwards compressor. It turns the audio down during the loudest portion of our program content, which often has an impact on the uh, the dynamic envelope of the sound going through it. And quite often that's maybe the effect that we're going for with the compressor. Here though, with the drums, I really do want to keep that transient rich quality of the drums relatively intact. So so what I did, again, was set up a parallel send going to this compressor here. And on this compressor, I have it in a pretty aggressive mode. Um, this is a McDSP CB101 compressor. It's just a, a simple compressor. The uh, compression ratio is cranked up very high in a limiting mode. It's a relatively fast attack and a moderately fast release. So I'm going to take a moment right now and I'm going to mention this pop-up that I've gotten a few times. Um, physical RAM is running low. Um, I want to make note of that just so that you do notice it because in a little bit later in this video, we're going to talk about that and why that plays an important role when we're preparing for the next stage. I actually do tend to leave this warning on rather than turning it off most of the time because I want the computer to warn me for these things. However, for the rest of this session, for the video, I am going to go ahead and turn this off. But it's important to recognize that w even with a computer right now, I'm working on a machine that has 20 gigabytes of RAM, but I'm also running a lot of virtual instruments and that eats up a lot of RAM. So there will be some additional steps that I may choose to take when it comes time to get the final version of this mix ready that I would then hand off to a client. So this compressor is in a relatively fast attack and a moderately fast release time. Um, and again, it's a high compression ratio at 10 to 1. It's really smashing the drums. And the process here is that we then add it back in sort of underneath. So interestingly, where uh, a normal compressor, we tend to hear the most aggressive artifacts from it during the loudest portions of the program content. In a parallel compressor, we tend to notice it most during the quieter portions. So I'm going to play through the, uh, the beginning of this drum part here, and then I'll bring in the parallel compressed version. So it's bringing the room up a little bit. We actually haven't even added in our virtual room. We're just getting a little bit of the room mics from the Steven Slate drums kit. And I'm gonna put the rest of the drums in there so you can hear how that does fill out the drum kit really nicely. So we're still getting a lot of that timbral variation from all the performance intensity changes that I've programmed into that drum part. We're getting that um, really great groove, but it's uh, a little more locked in in terms of where it's going to sit in the mix. So I believe that's where I was originally. I had it pushed up a little higher. So the last thing that I wanted to do to my drum kit, I wanted to add some room sound for this. And I knew because this was going for the, the sort of film score sound, which often has a significant amount of reverb, um, both because it's somewhat stylistically appropriate because of the rooms that a lot of film scores are recorded in, but um, also because cinema display in movie theaters tends to present in a very dry room. Um, so I have to admit, I've been unpleasantly surprised times when I've heard my work during film festivals in film in theaters, and it ended up soaking up a lot more of the reverb than I thought it was going to. So in any case, we're going to set up some reverb for our drums. And for this reverb, I'm using a convolution reverb. This is a convolution in McDSP's Revolver. This is actually one that I programmed years ago using a, an impulse generator program called Voxango. And I built this based on an actual real recording studio. I won't tell you which one, but it is a recording studio that's been used a lot for film score recording. So um, it's not an exaggeration to say that I've seen pictures of film scoring sessions with, in which drum kits were placed in the location in the room that I simulated with this one. You notice it's a Studio 2 drums. So here's what that sounds like. 
again, we've been listening to this dry, so I'm gonna add in our room tone here. So it's a pretty big room. It's uh, it's not a it's not a gentle reverb at all. It's pretty big and over the top. I know that's not always necessarily the style. Um, certainly for a lot of new metal, we wouldn't necessarily go with anything quite that reverby. Um, but again, going for a very cinematic style here, and so that got my drum mix sounding a little more powerful and a little more in line with really where I wanted it with the guitars. <laughs> So next area I wanted to go back and do a little bit of cleanup work on. Uh, the next area in my mix that I focused on was really getting all of the guitar tones and the bass tones really tied together. So we've been listening to this for most of the session with all of that processing turned off. But on all of these guitars, I did add some subtle reverb, mainly to focus that guitar part, that specific component of our Uber guitar part, into the specific regions where it was contributing most directly and to just get a cleaner, tighter uh, fusion of those tonal elements. <laughs> terms of what I'm actually doing again. These are relatively um, modest changes. I did take a pretty aggressive bite out of the low mids and rolled off the lows a little bit and then opened this one up uh, apparently at about 3.2k. It's companion track also on the left side. I mostly just did some subtractive EQ, just took out some regions that it was probably competing a little bit when those two tones were played together. Then I've got my uh, my upper guitar part. That one I focused in a little bit more and ended up notching out a little bit. It looks like I got pretty aggressive around 4K. Uh, it's not uncommon for me that that upper high guitar part, especially if I go with a high gain tone, will start to get a little overwhelming in that like 3.8 to 4.5K range where our ears are very sensitive. So I apparently dipped that out a little bit and then did a little bit of opening up on the top end. Finally, on this one, it looks like I really just opened up the top end and took a little bit out in the mids. So a few other things that I have going. Again, you can see I have my, uh, the way my signal chain is set up for the bass is based on the idea that this is where I recorded my DI. This is the actual bass track. But I wanted to be able to send a fairly direct, un would version of that to an amp simulator where I was going to do some EQ processing before I fed it into the amp simulator. I wanted to have a different EQ on the DI. And so in order to route that, I had to put all of that downstream. So I used this as my basic track. It's going out on a DI bus that's coming in on both of these tracks. So on my DI, I did a little bit of EQ and I added some compression. And again, this is not going to the bass amp. This is just the DI version that we are hearing here. So here's the unprocessed DI. And that's the processed. Likewise, on the amp simulator, I did a little bit of an EQ boost upstream. Um, by a little bit, I mean a heck of a lot, actually, almost a 12 dB boost in the 7.5K range. And, you know, the reason for that, I was going for a very specific kind of bass tone, and that top end boost 
is something that uh, I, I associate it with wall basses. It uh, gives a very particular tone. Maybe um, you might associate it with a band like Tool, that sort of bright, punchy, clicky kind of tone um, that, again, is very particular. Then downstream from it, I went ahead and did some EQ shaping just to get that big, heavy, distorted, big muff pie sound to fit into the landscape a little better. So all of these tracks, or rather these two tracks, the DI and the bass amp simulation, are being sent to a stereo bass submix. And on that, I do have a little bit of bus, just a little bit of group EQ. Um, this was something that I would have added at the very end of the process, just trying to get the bass to collectively kind of all of these tracks to come together a little bit. And then in this application, I did something that I don't do very often at a at a track level, on a mastering level, but I do it quite a bit with the bass guitar, and that is multi-band compression. So my bass guitar is going through, oh, excuse me, I flipped the wrong plug in there. My bass guitar is going through a two-band multi-band compressor, and if you're not familiar with this, this means there's a crossover and one band of the crossover is going through one compressor. The other band is going through another compressor. So what I did was I set it relatively um, low, basically at about 190 hertz. So everything below 190 hertz is going through one compressor. And that one's actually set a little higher with a higher ratio. I really wanted to lock in the low end on this so it really is, is there, it's impactful, it's doing exactly what I want. And this is what that band sounds like. The upper band, this band, it's a bit more gentle compression. It's about a two to one ratio and um, similar settings in terms of attack and release. So. So what that does, that gives me a bit more dynamic life in the upper end without the low end occasionally running away from me. So putting them together, So that ended up being my final bass tone. I took a similar approach for the main rhythm guitars through this. So they are all subgrouped and running through this submix track. And I do have some group EQ. I have an, actually have a bit of an active EQ. Very, very, very gently pulling off a little bit in the high end just in a couple of places. Then I'm going through and part of the reason I did that upstream from this was to control how hard I'm hitting this unit. So this is a universal audio Pultec simulation. And if you're not familiar with this, this is basically a, a vintage, um, very well-regarded high shelf and low shelf EQ with a couple of unique peculiarities about it. Um, but the big thing here is I'm mainly just opening up the top end on those guitar tracks a little bit. And that one does not have any makeup gain. Normally I would have my makeup gain dialed in a little bit better so that I wouldn't get that boost when I turn it off and on. I prefer to be able to make my decisions on what I'm doing with an EQ based purely off the, the timbre, not just because it got louder. But in any case, that's, uh, that's what that one is adding. And then I also on this one have uh, another tape simulator. This time it's in Swiss mode, which I assume is a Studer simulation. And that was all just to glue those tracks a little bit together once I had all of the rest of the elements in there. So on the piano track, I, I 
have big lots and lots and lots of lows and low mids and mids coming from the guitars. So for the piano, what I really wanted was some top end shimmer for it. So I pretty aggressively rolled off the low end um, doing sort of the fake Baxendale trick where you pull down to a very low frequency and then widen the cue out very wide to take out most of the low end. Effectively, I kind of ended up doing a bit of a tilt EQ. If you notice on the high side, I have a I have a, a band set with a very wide Q opening up the top end. And then I found there was a specific little place right around 2.1K where I was able to get that part to poke out a little bit through the guitar parts. I didn't really want it to sound like there was a piano part playing an obvious piano part. I wanted that sense that it was a big guitar tone with some timbral richness and complexity. So again, I ended up here for those three elements. So that got me through that section. Next up, I spent a little bit of time tightening things up in the end section. The main thing that I ended up doing here was a little bit of compression on the brass. Um, and then finally, I added a reverb for the entire mix. Now, this reverb, again, I'm using Revolver. This is also a simulation of the same studio that I was using on my drum kit, just in a different position, a position more traditional for where they would have tracked um, orchestral instruments or voices in that space. So um, they are similar reverbs. They are not exactly the same, but they do represent the same space from different spatial positions. And the only thing unusual about that, I did something that was pretty common um, starting in the 80s with big electric guitar parts where we pan them out to the sides like this. I flipped the reverb so that the reverb, the guitar on the left side, its reverb is coming from the right side. Again, we're not usually very conscious of it because all of the guitar parts are playing at the same time, but it does give us a slightly different character to the room. And at this point, I do have pretty much everything going to that room. It is tucked back in a little bit underneath. And again, it's mainly there to give us that sound of, of film scores where a lot of musicians played together all in that one room. Um, this is a place where I might spend a little more time if this were an actual cue that I was prepping for, um, for public use. And, you know, I may go back and eventually put this in my library and go back and do some of that work. But I do find getting that last set of environmental cues together in a way that really marries all of your diverse sound sources really does a lot in terms of pulling things together. So we can definitely hear that reverb in play now. And that pretty much gets us through the rest of what I did on the mix for this. So let's talk a little bit about wrapping up a project like this. Once I've got to this stage that I've got all the music composed, I've gone back, I've retracked everything, I've got performances that I'm happy with that feel compelling and engaging. So the next step is going to be to do one of two things. Um, sometimes I'll do as I've done here and I'll get my mix very close. And then I'll go through and take each set of instruments and print them one at a time. And the goal there is that I would like to make every other plugin inactive and just run the audio for Steven Slate drums and print that to audio tracks. 
Then I'll disable Stephen Slate drums and maybe I'll go through and do one of the east-west instruments through play. But the, the reason there is that I find with a lot of these virtual instruments, when you run into memory usage issues with some of these large sample sets. Often there are subtle uh, clicks, pops, other little digital artifacts that happen when they're trying to round robin samples, when they're trying to do various things to handle the samples, and it ends up creating some unpleasant audio artifacts where we can sort of hear the, the process that's happening there. So I usually like to go back and print all of those tracks as audio. Now, if I've if I'm really happy with my mix and I'm 100% set, I may actually print those with the effects in place. Quite often, I would actually intentionally take all of those things off, print them, and then I would add all of these effects to the printed audio. And at that point, it's basically like mixing from tape or mixing a regular Pro Tools session with no virtual instruments. Again, that process is really essential if we want to get the cleanest possible renderings of our virtual instruments, and we don't have a massive powerhouse workhorse machine that can just handle this kind of heavy lifting. Again, I've got 20 gigabytes of RAM in this machine. Um, I'm, you know, it's, it's a well-outfitted machine, but there's a lot of samples going on in this. So as it gets busier and busier and busier and has to render this stuff very close to real time, I've got a, a fairly low buffer size, I'm always concerned that I'm going to get a less than stellar rendering, that I'm going to get some clicks and pops and some other subtle things that just uh, make the, the recording sound a little less than it could. So the last couple of things that I, um, as I've gone through this a couple of times, I've um, gone through this lecture, unfortunately, four times now, um, dealing with technical issues. But at this point, um, I've gone through it enough times that probably if I do go back and do this as a library queue, I would add maybe an additional part or two through this end, through this build at the end. While I really love this earthquake, earthquake ensemble groove, It does loop all the way through, and I sort of built with terrace dynamics. I just keep adding more and more instruments. That works really well, but if I had a few more minutes, I might want to go through and add a couple other elements. And in fact, since many of you are, well, as the scoring for visual media students, you're probably um, on a fairly tight budget. Let's take a look at a plugin. This is actually a freebie that's really useful for us in our situation. So this is a freebie. Um, however, you do have to have the real version of Contact Player to run it. So it's going to take me a minute to get this loaded up. So I'm going to load contact, and then I'm going to go ahead and pull up the specific library that I'm looking for here. And the sample library I'm looking from, looking for comes from a company called uh, Strezov. I believe they're a Bulgarian company. So this is a Tycho drum sample library that they provide as a freebie. It's a demo. But one of the nice things about it is because of how they have the groupings, it's a very playable library. Um, so let me... Uh... Very playable, very dynamic, and because you have multiple iterations, it's really easy with two fingers to sort of get the same kind of effects as a real drummer would using right hand, left hand. And you can even play both hands at the same time and kind of flam a little bit. So 
So uh, my inclination is that I'd probably go back and add just a live performed part through that section and just thicken this thing out a little bit more and make it that much more busy, that much more epic, that much more crazy and over the top. So with all of that in mind, I'll give you one last uh, listen through to how this cue came together. Hopefully this has been informative to not only get into the composition process on all of this, but then see how I approach mixing and getting a final assembly for these things together. So here we go. Thanks for watching.